Hi folks, it's Dion Bozak from Scaled Analytics. Recently we've had a couple of incidents with aircraft approaching into airports with the incorrect altimeter settings set. In October 2021 there was a CRJ100 approaching Lyon and the crew had to take a couple of approaches because their altitude was off and air traffic control caught it. And then in May 2022 we had another similar incident this time with the Airbus A320 on approach into Paris. Again, the, the crew in ATC identified the problem and, and they landed without incident, which was, which was great. But this has created uh, enough uh, attention in the industry that EASA um, just published an article back in August of this year uh, looking at some of the ways flight data monitoring can help minimize the chance of these types of errors becoming a significant uh, incidents or worse. So I want to talk a bit about how our customers use their flight data monitoring program to, to try to catch these types of things and again you know minimize the risk of this happening. Now we've included some links below. I've got uh, a couple of links to the uh, incidents I mentioned earlier as well as a link to the EASA article uh, if you want to take a look at that. Also if, if reading is more your thing uh, I'm also going to include a link to a blog that we posted a couple weeks ago which basically goes over all the things I'm going to uh, discuss in this video. Now before I get into how flight data monitoring can help reduce the, the risk of these altimeter setting errors, I want to provide a little bit of background on how a pressure sensitive altimeter works. I realize some of our audience is more aviation hobbyists uh, and you, you watch some of these videos or read our blogs out of interest. So I'd like to give a little bit of background um, just for those that, that aren't aware. Now if you are an aviation professional, you know how an altimeter works and you understand what the safety implications are, please skip ahead. Um, there'll be some, some links at the bottom there for you to, to skip ahead of the video and then we'll catch up to, with you when we're done here. Now if you're still with us, let me give you a real high level overview of how a pressure sensitive altimeter works. It's a very basic design. It, it hasn't changed much in the last few decades and for good reason. It, it's very reliable and it works quite well at, at what it does. Now an altimeter, you have an instrument that, that goes into an airplane and th there's a case and that case is vented to the outside air. Inside the case there's a diaphragm and it's sealed and uh, I'm going to refer to it as a balloon because just to keep things simple that, that's pretty much what it is. It's a sealed balloon. It's got a gas inside and, and the pressure is steady. Now as your airplane climbs the pressure outside decreases so the pressure in that instrument case is going to decrease but the pressure in that balloon stays the same so as we're climbing that balloon is going to get bigger. As it expands it's connected to some gears and levers and it turns these dials on the front of our instruments, our front of our altimeter, that tells us what altitude we're at. So those numbers get bigger. As we descend, the outside pressure increases. So the pressure inside that altimeter case is going to increase. But the pressure inside the balloon stays the same. And now that balloon's getting squished and it's getting smaller. And again, through those gears and, and connections, the front of the instrument is now going to start showing us smaller numbers. So, and that's basically how it works. Uh, again, it's very simple, it's very effective, and it, it's been very reliable over the years. Now, although it's quite reliable, the altimeter is not without its limitations. So all it is really measuring is a, is a difference in pressure between that, that balloon and what's going on outside. It really doesn't know if that pressure is different because we're climbing or descending, or if it's different because the weather changed um, in the last few hours. So take for example, we're at an airport, we're at our local airport, sitting in our small airplane, and that airport is at an elevation of 1500 feet above sea level. If we're sitting in our airplane and the altimeter is set properly, and I'll, I'll, I'll say, talk about what that means in a, in a minute here, if our altimeter is set properly, it should be showing 1500 feet. Note that it's not showing zero. There are, our altimeters measure the altitude above sea level, not above the ground. So our altimeter should be showing 1500 feet. Now let's say um, we're living in our airplane because we, we spent all our money on it and we go to sleep. We wake up the next day and a low pressure system uh, moved through the area. 
So we wake up, we look at our altimeter, and the pressure has gone down compared to the night before. So the altimeter doesn't know if we climbed or what's going on. It just knows the pressure is lower than it was yesterday. So our altimeter is going to show a larger number. Let's say it's 2,000 feet. We know that we're not at 2,000 feet because we're still sitting in our airplane, we haven't left the ground, and we know the field elevation here is 1,500 feet. Now hopefully you can start to see that this is potentially serious. So what if, for example, we weren't sitting in our airplane, but instead we were on approach in our home airport, and the visibility is poor, the weather is coming in, and you know, we're relying on our instruments. Well, we're going to touch down, in this case hit the ground, when the altimeter is reading 2,000 feet not 1,500 feet. We're still expecting 500 feet to go. So this is really serious. This is um, something we need to, to address. Now, thankfully, the altimeter is designed to get around these limitations, and it, it's really fairly simple. On an altimeter, there's an altimeter setting window, and there's a little knob that we can turn to adjust the altimeter setting. As we turn that knob up and down, the altitude goes up and down, and the altimeter setting changes. The altimeter setting is something that we get from the weather office or ATC. We don't have to calculate it, it's just we, we get it and we set it and that's done. Once we've set the correct altimeter setting in our back to our little airplane, we should see an altitude of about 1500 feet. So that's good. And now we, we know the altimeter is set, we can go flying. So you might be asking yourself, well what's the problem if we just set the altimeter setting before we go? Why is there such a chance for error in doing this? You set it once and you're done. Well, the pressure changes all the time, right? With just with the weather systems, pressure is changing. So if you were to go on a one-hour flight around your local airport, when you come back into land, it's almost certain that you're going to have to adjust your altimeter setting just because of changes in the weather. Now, in a high-performance airplane, and when I say high-performance, I mean the, the typical transport aircraft that you, you fly on when you go on vacation, when those aircraft climb above 18,000 feet, the crew will adjust the altimeter to a standard setting. And if you're interested, it's 29.92 inches of mercury. And they'll set that as they're, they're climbing above 18,000. The reason that they do that is so that everyone above those altitudes is flying with the same altimeter setting. At those altitudes, we're more worried about airplanes running into each other than we are about them running into the ground. Now, as that high-performance aircraft descends below 18,000 feet, they'll get an updated altimeter setting and dial that into the altimeter and, and continue their descent and approach. And they may update the altimeter setting a couple more times from the descent to the approach. So it's always being, uh, not always, but it's regularly being adjusted throughout the flight. So it's very important that we get this correct Now, is this a frequent problem? And the honest answer, for, for me at least, is that I'm, I'm not sure that we know. One of the unfortunate things, in my opinion, with, with accident investigations is that once we've done an investigation, we, we learn that the underlying um, faults or the underlying problems have been fairly widespread, more widespread than anyone really thought to, that they thought they were, until we have an investigation and the flights are scrutinized in a lot of detail that we see that you know this this could have been prevented early on and and really that's the exciting thing about flight data monitoring and what i like about it is we can collect this data now and we can determine if this is a widespread problem right we can see is it really a problem is it happening frequently or not uh, once we collect the data we can start to, to to determine that and answer those types of questions so with that in mind how can flight data monitoring help us with this particular event? Now, there's actually quite a few ways, and if you, if you look at the EASA article, you'll see there's, there's been a few suggestions, about half a dozen suggestions from industry. Some are a bit more complicated than others, but there's, there's certainly lots of ways. Um, here at Scale Analytics, my, my philosophy, I, I like the saying that, that's loosely attributed to Einstein, keep things as simple as possible, but no simpler, right? So we don't want to make things too complicated. And with that in mind, there's, there's two pretty simple yet effective ways that we can monitor for this problem. Most modern aircraft, uh, thankfully, do have altimeter setting recorded. If you don't have altimeter setting recorded, then, you know, 
unfortunately, there's not much you can do. But again, thankfully, it's recorded on most modern aircraft. And, and where it's recorded, it's, it's usually recorded in two spots. There's a left and a right altimeter setting or pilot and co-pilot. So one of the really simple things we can do is just take those two parameters, look at the difference, and if they're off by a certain value, we can create an event. Um, so we'll know that someone's wrong, um, maybe both are wrong, we, we don't know, but at least you'll, you'll, you'll flag it and, and, and catch it and you can investigate it further. Um, I'm not really convinced that that's going to be that effective. Uh, I, I kind of think that, you know, the crew would catch this um, before it becomes an issue. You know, they're, they're always cross-checking instruments, and, and I, I think this would be identified and, and corrected. But I could be wrong, and it's so easy to, to monitor that we might as well monitor it, right? It, it's, it's a very easy one to do. What I think is more effective is, is actually getting the altimeter setting from the weather data, or in, in our case, the METAR, or the METAR for uh, my neighbors to the south. The METAR is basically the weather report for an airport. It's not a forecast, it's just the observed weather at the time the report was issued. They're typically issued once an hour. Um, sometimes they're issued more frequently if the weather's changing quite quickly, but generally they're, they're issued once an hour. And one of the pieces of information that you can get from the METAR is the altimeter setting. So what we've been doing with some of our customers is taking the altimeter setting from the METAR and comparing it to what we're seeing in the flight data. And then if there's any significant differences, we'll raise an event, we'll flag it, and, and if we need to, we'll investigate it. So here's a, a sample report of how we can do this. You can see that we're, we're capturing the left and right altimeter settings. Um, we're also getting the, the airport. So we've got those left and right altimeter settings. And you know, I talked earlier about that miscompare. Um, we, can, we can monitor for that. Again, it's so easy to, to, to monitor. We might as well capture it. You can see that there. We can also see the airports uh, where the approaches are taking place. And that's nice. When we start looking at trends, we've got that information and we can see, you know, is one airport worse than the other? And then finally, we've got the METAR uh, reported altimeter setting and the difference between what's reported by the METAR and um, what's been dialed up in the aircraft. If that exceeds a certain value, we, we flag an event. Now, something to keep in mind with this chart, this is all fictional data. Um, I mean, obviously, we're not going to show customer data, but even if we did, customer data is much more boring than this. Uh, we don't see this event that frequently. This is here to, to just illustrate how you can monitor this, one way of, of, of capturing this type of event. Now, of course, for this to work, you need to be able to detect the airports in your flight data monitoring system somehow. If you have latitude and longitude recorded, this is generally pretty easy. If you have lat long, it should be accurate enough that we can determine the airport uh, that you landed at. If you don't, you're not out of luck yet. Um, if you can get the data from your flight scheduling system, we can pull the airport information out, sync it up with your data from your flight recorder, and, um, and then basically just capture the METAR data uh, as you normally would. Uh, most modern flight data monitoring software systems should be able to do that. Um, it's pretty basic stuff. Now just some tips if you, you do decide to set this up in your program. We, we do have a little bit of advice. Um, nothing earth shattering, but you know, when you're setting your trigger limits, don't set them too tight or too restrictive or narrow, whatever term you want to use. You need to keep in mind, you know, that the METAR could be up to 30 minutes old. So the altimeter setting that the crew got from ATC, it's probably going to be a little different than what was reported in the METAR. So, and you don't want to be capturing all these events because they're just nuisance events. These, these aren't safety concerns. What we're interested in finding is, is really human error where there's a, a significant difference between um, what's in the METAR and what the crew dialed up. So don't set your limits too tight. Um, you're just going to create headaches for yourself. Once you do get them set up, though, you want to exercise some patience, really. You, you just want to start collecting the data. You're, if you're operating like our customers and what we've seen, this isn't going to happen often, but it is going to happen. So you want to try to identify any patterns uh, that, that, that might be building. Now, having said that, 
if you do see a significant event, by all means investigate it. Um, if you can, interview the crew. And when you're interviewing the crew, keep in mind this isn't to be punitive, you know, the opposite. It, it's to get more information from them that you can't get from the data. This would be things like what was the workload like in the flight deck? Uh, what was traffic like in the pattern? ATC, you know, how busy was it? Things that the data won't tell you, you can get from the crew. And this information is invaluable for, for your report. Um, more than likely, though, it, it's probably going to be somewhat mundane data, so you want to collect it over time, maybe a couple months. Once you've got enough data, you want to be looking at it, and again, try to identify some trends. Ask yourself some questions like, is this only happening at certain airports? Uh, is it only happening in certain weather conditions? Is it IMC versus uh, VMC? Is it a time of day issue? Is it, is it only, you know, maybe there's a pilot fatigue issue that you might be able to identify. Uh, is it limited to certain aircraft types if you fly multiple types of aircraft? These are the types of questions you want to ask yourself. And once you can answer those questions, you can start taking action to try to minimize the risk of, of these issues turning into something bigger. So hopefully you've seen how, you know, one a couple of ways in which flight data monitoring can help identify these types of events. Your flight data monitoring software or service provider should be able to help you get this all set up. But if you ever need any help, we're always here and we're happy to help. You can send us an email or, or give us a call and we'll do what we can to help you get the most out of your flight data monitoring program. Until then, fly safe.